episode of the Nerd Gym Report. I'm your host, Pablo, and joining me as always is Mr. Brian Schultz. We got a great show for you today. A lot of news to go over. Brian, how you doing? Not bad, not bad. Busy times. A lot going on. Hard to yeah. keep up, but let's get to it. Yeah. Um, we wanted to just go over um, Loki, but we don't have that much time to go over so many things, it's just Loki. And then we, there's a big discussion that we want to have for uh, Spider-Man three. We're going to do a separate video for that as well. Cause that's going to be a lengthy discussion. Uh, so we're just going to go over the news, but I got to say Loki is, 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 is up there, man is, is right now. If we were to rank, the series so far that we have gotten with WandaVision, Falcon, and Loki. Loki is my number one right now. Wow. Loki's my number one right now. Uh, but yeah, let's get into it. The Warner Brothers. The Warner Brothers had on, on their plans for DC projects on HBO Max. So this comes to us from Heroic Hollywood. Uh, so Warner Brothers Pictures Group Chair Toby Emmerich recently talked about their plans for DC projects on HBO Max and connected them to films. Many DC projects are on the way to HBO Max. Currently, Peacemaker is filming while the Green Lantern series is expected to begin later this year. Matt Reeves is also developing a Gotham PD series and the Batman Cape Crusader animated series. Reports suggest Warner Brothers may put films like Batgirl, Blue Beetle, and Static Shock on the streamer as well. This sounds to me like they try th this sounds familiar very familiar as if they're you know they're trying to get on board and they've given up and said yo we just got to do what they're doing right um hbo max will also have shows like titans and doom patrol which are are in their own dc universe however it sounds like Warner Brothers has plans to connect what's on HBO Max to the films coming out based on recent comments from Warner Brothers picture group chair Toby Emmerich to the Los Angeles Times. And I quote, HBO Max presents a huge opportunity for DC. I'm sure it allows us to make high quality mid budget superhero movies that reintroduce lesser known titles while also crossing over standout character from our bigger films into original series connecting the dc cinematic universe with max gives our fans more ways to explore the dc multiverse and more chances to enjoy more great stories with these beloved characters brian you know what i like about marvel man that we're getting into this multiverse thing and we understand why this is a multiverse. For me, it feels like with DC, because they have all these things going on that they never really planned out, oh, this is a multiverse. We're just gonna make it into a multiverse without giving any real explanation as to how this came about. They're just saying this is a multiverse, this is Earth, whatever, and this is just the way it is. Perhaps they may provide an explanation Later, maybe let's see how they do that if they do that. But this, this just to me looks like Warner Brothers just throwing the towel and say, "Yo, let's let's really do what they're doing and succeed at it." Because to me, honestly, doing, I mean, you can go ahead and do your separate things and be somewhat successful, right? But you put yourself in a position to. Uh, fail a lot more than succeed. Brian, what are your thoughts on this uh, uh, article? I think the most important word in that entire article is mid-budget. Mid-budget. And, and we're going to talk about budget in this show again <laughs> because I struggle with this and you and I have discussed this. This is not a genre that's built for mid-budget because of the effects, because of ensemble casting, because of sometimes the need to have an A-lister headline your show or a big, it's very, I think it's very hard to make a true mid-budget comic book property, but they're admitting 
that that's kind of the lane that they're filling here, which it's not to say you can't make something interesting, but I think the challenge is going to be we know how Marvel shows look, and those are not mid budget. Yeah. And it shows. You can yeah. see where the money goes. Yeah. I would argue Umbrella Academy, the boys look tight every week. We can see where the money is going. Not that there's always effects all the time, but it yeah. looks well done. It looks yes. well made. I think that creates a challenge. If you're going to be mid-budget, you, you still have to make it look good. It yeah. can't look CW. No offense exactly. to CW. They're good, they're good at what they do, but that's a different tier of programming. So when they, I see the word mid-budget, my my alarm bell and my radar are up, and it's a point I made last week, which is I think what's going on is there's a lot of as the before the merger closes, let's get stuff into production, let's throw it against the wall, and let's see what sticks without spending enormous amount of money unless it's unless it's uh, not to this card, it's Galaxy Suicide Squad or unless it's um, Aquaman or Wonder Woman or something that we already know there's probably going to be an audience for that, yeah. that's what it boils down to to me and it's just a completely different DNA than what Marvel is trying to do I, I mean I, I have to digress but you know, we we don't have a multiverse in the DC yet. They've told us it's coming, but the movie that's supposed to create it is being shot right now. It hasn't come out. Yeah. Marvel's told us it's coming, but Marvel already created it and teased it in uh, Far From Home. So it, yeah. it we, we were put into it for a brief moment mm -hmm. and we're being very carefully metered out. The DC multiverse is more the feel of like my kid making Legos <laughs> and she's really good at Legos. It's like you make a Lego project, you make two Lego projects and then you're like, wait, if I take this piece and that piece, I can kind of make a bridge <laughs> that goes between them and that sort of works, right? It looks yeah, kind of yeah. cool. That's what it feels like. Feel like. Yeah, Please, I mean... Uh, go, go cook on this for a bit because I know you have thoughts. The thing with the multiverse in Marvel is that when it comes it's more easily acceptable because they've taken their time. I mean, Loki does a fantastic job of explaining how this all arrives. And Spider-Man um, Far From Home, that's what it's called, right? Far From Home, the second one? Um, yeah. They teased it, but there wasn't really no explainer to it. And it was all a false um, reveal. Yeah. on behalf of Jake Gyllenhaal's character Mysterio. But this um, series from Loki does a hell of a job explaining it. And when it comes, you'll have no, there'll be no confusion as to what this is, is and how this came about. With DC, they have a tough time. They're going to have a tough time explaining it. And I just feel like there's always, even though, let's say that the whatever they release is in a multiverse, it could be great, but there'll still be that. How did this all happen again? How how is this a multiverse? There's gonna be that question. Well, I think one key distinction is that the Marvel multiverse is growing out of the building blocks that the comics provided. Correct. And so the, the Miss Minutes cartoon summary, I mean, don't underestimate how hard that actually is to write and not make it seem completely out of left field, right? Yeah. It looked kind of, deliberately looked kind of funny on screen, but they're actually giving you real Marvel content, right? The timekeepers, yeah. TVA, yeah. the time, the sacred timeline. That is all canon stuff. Chaos magic, that's canon and stuff you're putting these little foundational pieces in place as opposed to completely inventing and reverse engineering a movies only multiverse which is kind of what dc is doing now flashpoint is obviously a true comic arc but 
they're kind of putting that in the center of this like potpourri of other stuff and then going away from the comics it seems to create their multiverse so it, you know Marvel's still got to execute but I yeah. you can already see the pieces on the chessboard that they're pulling out of the comics yeah. to use as okay here's how we're going to try to get you to buy into what we're doing yeah yeah, let us know what you think in the comment section below about DC's plan to um, pretty much do what Marvel is doing with their Disney Plus shows and their films and sort of um, having that connective tissue so that when you go see these bigger events or these movies, there may or may not be some um, backstory in the the Disney, sh Disney Plus shows, but if there is you have something to refer to and understand where these events come about and how these uh, characters are motivated by whatever happened in these other Disney show, uh, 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 Disney show. So it's just time for them to really hunker down and plan this out and really think about this. And yeah, you want to compete, but take your time, give us good shows or movies and movie, sorry, and let it be. Let just you know slowly. I mean, it took more of a what? How many years to get all to get to Avengers Endgame? Are you kidding me? Oh, you know my thoughts about post merger. I think that is coming, and I think it's going to come under the guidance of someone out of the Marvel Parliament being hired to DC. That's still my prediction. I think when that happens, what you're talking about will occur. I think you'll see a purge of a number of projects that are on the board right now i think some will make it because i think some will find an audience and though and those will be built out and and that's where the re the real reboot's gonna happen before we move on there was another article we didn't i didn't want to feature as a topic but it is included it is is sort of related um there's a nightwing film that um the director or the person that's writing it hopes that it still gets done. I, I believe his name is Chris McKay. Yeah, he, he, he's he been wanting to do Nightwing. And I think Nightwing could be a dope film. It could be a dope film, but without the, again, you know me, without the essence and the aura and the presence of Batman, being in that film, not saying that Batman needs to be on that film in that, I guess, in that uh, during his uh, uh, transition into Nightwing, perhaps even flashbacks, perhaps the teachings that he gave him in, in, in his career to be to become Nightwing shows up. But if that's not there, if that piece is missing, then that's to me is is a failure, especially as a fan. So this will go to I mean they already used so Nightwing is the is the lead of Titans right so Dick Grayson has started out as Robin burns his suit spoil warning yeah gets rebooted as Nightwing at the end of season 2 and presumably is full Nightwing at the start of season 3 and your very point that show decided they couldn't do that yeah. without Bruce Wayne. Bruce Wayne is in that show. Yeah. As both flashback, vision, and in person. Yeah. He is in that show. A different version of him, but he is in that show. So were you to green light the Nightwing film now, it would be a lab experiment of is it confusing? If you're gonna <laughs> headline a show with with Nightwing and Batman, albeit not in the suit in a TV show and then say, wait, over here, completely different actor, completely different timeline, completely different feature film series with the same character. I don't know. I'm yeah. saying it's impossible, but that seems like a tall order. Yeah, I agree. Let us know what you guys think in the comment section below. Next up, Jupiter's Legacy battles over budget, executive purge factor in, ca in cancellation. This gives us a lot clearer understanding as to what happened with Jupiter's legacy. No doubt. Um, 
let's read this article that comes to us from the Hollywood Reporter. Uh, Jupiter's Legacy hit Netflix on May 7th to great expectations. I was very, very much excited to see this show. Um, the show, which adapts a well-regarded comic by Mark Millar, was the first project to emerge from Netflix 2017 acquisition of Miller's publishing line, Miller, Millar World. Unlike most of Millar's work, the superhero comics with a story that spans decades and prequel titles had a deeper character bench from which to draw and Netflix saw it as a way to further its own universe building ambitions to compete with Disney IP heavyweights Marvel and Star Wars and it has and it was to be the cornerstone of Mil of its Millar work ambitions look Netflix knew what they had to do in order to compete in this in this world of superheroes that Marvel's been killing um, Star Wars has had its little bumps in the rolls, but they're not giving up and they've come out with great shows with like The Mandalorian and hopefully with others that are coming up soon. Um, the show, however, seemed to be a victim of several factors, some of its own making, not some not, and illustrates the birthing pains of building from a highly publicized, publicized acquisition. The series, was the series was plagued with issues from the start with then showrunner Stephen D. Knight initially asking Netflix for a budget of at least 12 million per episode, according to sources. The streamer, however, backed him down to under 9 million. It wasn't too long into shooting that the show found itself over budget and running behind with the Knight never one to shy away from speaking his mind, according to people who have worked with him, clashing with Netflix over creative differences seems like the people over at netflix have been talking too much with wb execs and they're messing things up right the production was shut down about halfway through its eight episode shoot the night was replaced by sang q kim who then had to retool the first batch of episodes and there you th this is what happens it seems to happen every single time with any product or, or project you have someone come in and bring somebody else in and you see it in the show where there are elements that are good and then there's something else. It just doesn't work. And, it, and, and, article, it, and I couldn't get a comment you made to me out of my head, which was you said when you went through it, it felt to you like the series should have started a couple episodes in. And all I could think about <laughs> reading this article was, was that where the break point was yeah. between the new showrunner and the old one. I don't, I, it, it, it could be, man. It could be because there was an episode that were like, wow, if they would have started with this, how different would this have been? And it, look, let's keep, let's continue reading. Issues didn't stop there, however, as even after rapid production, the show spent an inordinate amount of 2020 in post-production. Louis Leterrier, the filmmaker behind Netflix's acclaimed Dark Crystal and Lupin series, which is a dope show, by the way. I don't know if you've caught it. Lupin? Uh, I've seen a bit of it. It is excellent. It's not is what it... you expect. And don't watch it in English, right? That's the other thing. Uh, no, I, yeah, I watch it in his, in yeah. his native language. Watch it with the subtitles. Yeah. Yes. And was brought in in the 11th hour as a consultant, according to sources, but the move was too late to save the troubled show. It shows, this shows that Netflix really wanted this to work. Yeah. They were trying to make this work. They brought in somebody to consult and they were really trying to get this to work and, and it just didn't pan out. Um, with episode spends now reaching above even what the night originally asked for, show, show insiders say he was proven right in some respects. Um, this is a quote by an exec Oh no, sorry. As a, a from a producer, Marvel shows are fifteen million to twenty million per episode. Notes one producer working in the comic book space. If you're going to make a big superhero show, you need at least that much. I was very excited to see this uh, show, and I was very disappointed in how it turned out. And now we know why. And. It's unfortunate when you have someone that comes in with an idea you and halfway something goes crazy where you don't agree with what he's doing and then you get rid of him and you bring somebody in. It just never works, it seems. I, I don't know if you know of, an, uh, of a situation where it did work. 
I can think of a few, but so one very notable one in movies is Rogue One. Okay. So Gareth Edwards, who directed Godzilla and Monsters, is the listed director on Rogue One, but it's kind of mm-hmm. known that he was dismissed, let go in the post-production process. So Tony Gilroy, who's one of the most famous screenwriters in the world, came in and effectively cleaned that movie up and changed it. But it obviously was an enormous success. It was mm-hmm. 530 million domestic box in 1.2, 1.3. So there's an example where it did work. Mm-hmm. I would actually even submit to you that Superman 2 worked. Yeah. Richard Donner never made it to the end. Richard Lester finished the movie. I still find the original cut to actually be a very watchable and entertaining movie. The mm-hmm. Donner cut's interesting, but I think the original one worked. Mm-hmm. But it's hard. And in this case, it sounds like there were actually three cooks in the kitchen. Yeah. Because Louis Leterrier, the article doesn't mention, he directed The Incredible Hulk. Ed Norton, Tim and, Roth, and that was the best the Incredible Hulk, Hulk film I've well, ever they seen. They brought him to try to save it in. Now, Stephen Denight is an interesting study because he was heavily involved and was the showrunner for the Daredevil show on Netflix. So okay. This is a guy who had success for Netflix. It's a shame. It's weird because Netflix is not known for penny pinching. Yeah. And I'm a little surprised. Right? I'm a little surprised that they looked at this show and said it's an $80 million concept instead of a $100 million concept. And then they wound up spending 130 anyway. And quite honestly, look, I'm going to, this is a re- sort of a rhetorical question, but I mean it in jest. Where did the money go? Because <laughs> it's not like the effects of the fight scenes or superpowers look, looked all that great on screen. So the exactly. money probably went to the reshoot and the redo of three, four episodes. But the, the ultimate look of the superhero part of this show was actually one of the bigger disappointments I thought in the show so it, it all kind of went wrong the other thing that came to light in this article is there was more of an audience for this than I think I realized given yes. how the reviews were and given how yes. you know, poorly we received it so yeah. it shows you that Netflix is like even though there was an audience this was just like a sinkhole to them and they're like we can't wipe our hands fast enough of this and just move on so that's an interesting call as well that they wouldn't have maybe gone back to the well one more time with a single vision and said hey can yeah. we build this audience out yeah uh, an interesting call there but it goes back to the first discussion it's like this is what i mean like you gotta shell out you gotta shell out to show out and it's yeah. like I mean, when you got Amazon spending half a billion dollars on one season of Lord of the Rings, why are you sitting around being like, is it 80? Is it 90? Like, you already know the answer. Yeah, man. You can't be cheap about it. If you're going to compete, if you're saying you want to compete, then compete. Don't penny pinch, especially if you're sitting on money that you're you're spending money on, on a bunch of stuff and you can't. And, and, and if you want to compete with Disney and Marvel and Star Wars and you're penny pinching. I, I, and let me read this this final thing, because this is this was an interesting thing. Miller and Netflix spun the cancellation by saying Jupiter is going to be a universe with a new live action series based on an unrelated Millard comic uh, title, Super Cooks, which I made fun of in our last show. But after reading the synopsis of it and all, it's, it sounds very, very, very interesting. It sort of sounds like a um, Ocean's Eleven type situation with super villains. And so it, that's going to be interesting to see. Let's see if they pull it off. But yeah, let us know what you guys think in the comment section below about um, how this all went down. Would you have wanted a second try at a second season of Jupiter's Legacy with a, with a, with a, 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 a a more cohesive unit and, and focus on bringing a, 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 a Jupiter's Legacy season two to 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 Netflix. <sighs> Brian, I probably would have given it a second chance. I think they lost me, but you could have pulled me back in if you told me it was good. <laughs> yeah, I think I think that there was a lot of brilliant stuff in there, but very rare. Not enough to 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 keep me like I'm fine with them canceling it because I think it was it, it was just it was just bad um but they had some moments where you're like this could have worked this could have been great but 
they, I mean, they fell into the trap of all this creative, di creative difference. When you hear that in, in a project, you know, there are big issues and hopefully they can, you know, they can recover. And, but more, more often than not, it doesn't seem to, to, to happen. So let's see, man, they, they may, who knows? They may attempt to, to, to revive this. Let's see how, what Super Crooks done. Because if this, if Super Crooks is in the same universe and it's successful, then there's a possibility, there's, there's still room for Jupiter's legacy to continue in this universe. Let's see. Let's see. Next up, Boba Fett series ties into original trilogy. I was excited to read this article. This this comes to us from Dark Horizons. Uh, Disney and Lucas Films upcoming The Book of Boba Fett. I wish I would have just called it The Book of Fett. That sounds more like The Book yeah, of I'm Fett. <laughs> <laughs> Series won't just serve as a follow-up to the second season of The Mandalorian. It'll also tie heavily back to the original film trilogy. As part of a recent interview with Rotten Tomatoes, the show starred... Tamura Morrison confirmed, and he was uh, Jason Momoa's pops in Aquaman. In Aquaman, correct? He was. Yeah. Confirms the event series will fill in the character's backstory right where we saw him in both The Empire Strikes Back and The Return of the Jedi. I everybody who is a Star Wars fan is going to be curious to find out what that story would look like. And what transpired when he got swallowed up by that big worm. That's everybody. Everybody's going to want to know how it ties into the Empire Strikes Back and the Return of the Jedi. Everybody's going to be work, work, waiting for that. Um, indeed, Morrison seems excited to be back. He's also on this. He also understands the pressure that's on the series like like this from fans and other corners and hopes the series will deliver on those fronts. And I quote from him. I just hope I meet the expert. He's nervous. Because the success of the Mandalorian is out there and he's going to, you know, follow up to that. So I just hope I meet the expectations because you can somehow kind of feel those things. Definitely on the book of Boba, you can get more of a sense and a feeling for if it's working or not. So I think with being involved with that series of the Mandalorian and having a re-entry, it has created a little bit more expectation but yeah i feel good we've done some good work and he also mentions that Ro robert rodriguez uh directed several episodes of the new series but there are also some wonderful directors involved on other episodes as well listen i think robert rodriguez uh directed either the second to last episode he directed uh, the episode where baby yoda's on top of the yes. hill yes yes Yes, they're fighting on the hillside, which is actually, and he was a late substitute to direct that episode. It's short, it is really action. -packed. Yes, it was a very good episode. Listen, I'm high off of this uh, 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 this show coming, and it's going to be released this year, December, I believe. And I'm looking forward to it. What do you think of? Are you looking forward to Boba Fett? And and tell me, are you excited about the the connections to? the prior films uh, of the first trilogy. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I can't really think of a good analog for Boba Fett. It is one of the weirder, like, clearly this character was never designed originally to be this cult hero that he's really become. And so when, when, when Tamira Morrison is talking about the pressure, you know, part of it is because he played Jango Fett in the yeah. Night of the Clones. Yeah. And, even even the Mandalorian is not Boba Fett. There is a little bit of this, like this is the real deal guy, you know, yeah, that everyone yeah. has this attachment to over the last, you know, forty years, dating back to the first time he shows up in the Star Destroyer. So yeah, no, I think there's there's a pretty fun backstory here. I think we're not getting another Mandalorian season for a while, um, folks at home. If you if you have a chance, watch. It's on YouTube. Variety's actors on actors. Ewan McGregor, Pedro Pascal. They spent a lot of time talking about the respective Star Wars series in there. And Pedro Pascal lets slip. He actually admits that he wasn't supposed to say it, that they're that they haven't shot season three yet and they don't oh. have it on the calendar yet. 
Mm. And so this is what you're getting in the Mandalorian universe, really, for the next 12, 18 months. Wow. And so I think you know, there is going to be a lot of connectivity to the original trilogy, to the Mandalorian world. And yeah, I mean, super duper excited. It sounds like some of the other characters in Mandalorian may wind up popping up mm -hmm. in this show, not just... Um, I forget what Ming-Na Wen's character is called, the other bounty hunter that's with, with Fett in this yeah. movie. Um, so, the you know, sniper. It, it, yes, exactly. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm very excited for it. And the fact that Robert Rodriguez is doing multiple episodes, super excited. I think he's great at action, kind of like quick, snappy type yeah. films. Like, have you ever seen, like, from Dusk Called Dawn? Yeah, I'm, uh, let us know. I'm pretty sure everybody's uh, who, who who's a fan of the Mandalorian sh uh, show is excited to see... Uh, uh, Boba Fett um, and what story they're going to give us and how this all ties in and perhaps even ties into Obi-Wan series that's going to be interesting to see as well um, next up the Flash redesigns Miller's outfit uh, Andy Muschietti, this comes from this comes to us from Dark Horizons. Two weeks ago, the filmmaker Andy Muschietti teased the first look at the new bat suit being used in the upcoming Flash movie currently in production in the UK. Today, a few days ago, the filmmaker has posted another close-up logo. This time, showing off a look at the new suit that Ezra Miller, Barry Allen, the Flash will be wearing. Gone is the blood red exposed wiring of the Snyder films replaced by an almost electric crimson level of bright red with a texture that looks more akin to a circuit board imprinted on rubber aside from the metallic logo. Brian, you already know how I feel about Ezra Miller's Flash. Um, listen. We had a big discussion about the whole Justice League thing. You can, uh, I'll see if I, uh, I put a, a link in the in the in the in the video where we talk about the movie and the Flash, uh, the Ezra Miller's Flash. And there were moments in the Zack Snyder cut where you're like, okay, he was digestible, <laughs> you know. I, I I I liked when he was serious. I liked him when he was goofy and weird. I didn't like him. Um, it's crazy how they've sort of sweeped under the uh, under the rug his choking incident, and they're not even you know, letting that go. I guess, but um, Andy Muschietti, I think. obviously didn't like his costume perhaps didn't like too much of his portrayal of a flash and is looking to change a lot of the aspects that we didn't like it seems to me ezra miller is really um invested in this character perhaps he may have too much to say about it and how he wants to play it Hopefully, Andy can rein him in and do what I think is best for the character. Um, what do you think about this reveal? And uh, do you think Ezra Miller, Do you think we're going to get a different Flash from a, a to not? I don't know if a totally different Flash, but a better Flash than what we saw in Justice League. I think we're going to get a different Flash. What well, remains to be seen if it'll be better. I think there. You know, I think what they're trying to do. Well. I think what Andy Muschietti is trying to do is be diplomatic towards the Snyderverse version of Ezra Miller, but he's clearly changing. He's already said they're changing the speed force effects and they're changing the costume. So obviously it's not the same character yeah. other than in name. And, and You know, obviously Snyder versus dark. You know, his, his color palette was dark. I mean, yeah, Superman was a darker blue. Uh, Wonder Woman was also darker gold, darker blue. And mm -hmm. here, and Flash was almost a maroon more so than yeah. a, uh, a bright red. 
comics flash is obviously bright red what they mm-hmm. what they teased looks color wise more like comics flash yeah and so that's you know the obvious thing that jumps out but you said it i mean it comes down to what sort of performance is he going to extract from ezra, ezra miller because i i like you find him to be very polarizing and for me at least it's leans more annoying than endearing mm-hmm. and you know this guy is the centerpiece of the most important well what was the most important film in sort of dc's future um digestible can't be your ceiling <laughs> exactly be higher than that yeah <laughs> you <were trouble. laughs> yeah yeah um let's see what we get man uh andy machete he he's a you know well-regarded director correct yeah, I think, I mean, It Chapter One is probably one of the best Stephen King adaptations in horror movies of the last, you know, 10, 20 years. I mean, It Chapter Two was, where they were grown ups, was just more okay, but It Chapter One was eye openingly mm-hmm. good. And mm-hmm. I think that's what gives you hope mm-hmm. that he can adapt something big and complex and make it work. Mm-hmm. But yeah, there's a, as we said, there's a lot of baggage here. Now he did also he did also tweet a very cool image of the Michael Keaton Batman suit with the blood on it, which yeah, I thought yeah. was really kind of just a cool I don't know mood creator. And obviously we've seen some set photos of of what looks to be Michael Keaton on, yeah. on the set of the old Tim Burton Wayne Manor. Not really sure how they like recreated that, but yeah. it was it looked pretty much the same. So you know there'll be some nostalgic moments, but yeah, this movie's gonna ride or die with with Ezra Miller's performance. Whether we yeah. like it or not. Yeah, let us know what you guys think in the comment section below about this new flash or yeah, let's quote 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 unquote new flash. Um how it's gonna come across. Is is gonna be much different, a little bit different, better? Uh let us know in the comment section below. Uh next up, Portman's Thor look tease Marvel's cat or oh, Marvel's cast. This comes from some dark dark horizons. Recently, uh, a T-shirt um, showed what Natalie Portman's outfit is gonna look like, and to me, it, it's something you know you expect from Marvel to do. It's comic book accurate as yeah. AF, you know. It, and obviously, if you've been watching the show, you know what our concerns are with Taika Waititi's. Uh, next door outing will be and 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 what to expect from this we def- we definitely have concerns but in terms of look i never had an issue with thor and how it looked i think that opening sequence with in in, in thor ragnarok was dope visually things were dope it was just some of the characters and some of the way the story played out and, and some of too much humor, probably a little bit too much humor. Well, only the, well, the few things that that bothered me, some of the characterizations, like, for example, the Grandmaster, I thought was, you know, I guess not comic, but what you would expect from the Grandmaster. It was Jeff Goldblum. <laughs> I mean, he's, you know, he's entertaining, but I'm not here to be entertained by Jeff Goldblum. I want to see the Grandmaster. Like, Benicio Del Toro rendition of The Collector was, to me, that was The Collector. Right? But Jeff Goldblum was just Jeff Goldblum, and that's what I I really didn't like too much about it. And then, obviously, Mark Ruffalo's um, uh, performance, and that was 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 to me was was not great but um yeah natalie portman is gonna look like the comic books and so what are your thoughts on that brian oh man if it's not the toys it's the t-shirts i just wish i i wish i could actually unsee this um because it's good i think yeah. it looks really good i think it's a hard one another hard one to pull off and at least the way it looks on the t-shirt i'm like yeah they really pulled this out of the comics and made her look really believable and really awesome and she really looks like something out of mythology again i just i kind of feel like it it, 
I don't think it'll hurt too much, but I do feel like at the margin, it, it, had we never seen it and she popped up on screen in the actual costume, I think it would have had a you maybe a little you know greater impact. But I did have I, so that same T-shirt, and there's a second T-shirt floating around which shows him mm -hmm. in costume. I'm a wee, like, like a wee bit concerned. Why? His costume looks like it was changed a little bit, and he looks almost like, I don't know how to describe him. He almost looks like, um, remember how like in Masters of the Universe, Prince Adam used to have that like purple kind of V-neck shirt? It almost looks like he's wearing that, but like with no sleeves. <laughs> and like, I'm like, and it's red. I'm like, it looks a little yeah. weird. Yeah. agree with like I actually thought his armor has generally been pretty good through the series. I didn't really feel like there was a need to mess with that. So unless the story is necessitating that, I actually liked her look better than his oh, yeah. based just on how it's shown on the t-shirt. I think they want to expose a lot more skin on him this time um, rather than use rather than use the metallic um, armor that he has. Uh, well, the costume may not fit the way. He yeah, looks. yeah. So <laughs> we'll, we'll we'll see, man. I, again, our concerns is how crazy is this going to be, and, and how, how far out there is this going to be? Is it going to be too much humor? Is going to be too crazy? Let's see, man. Um, but I, again, we're, yeah. we're, not, we're, not, we're in a minority with, with regards to uh, how good Ragnarok was. But yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, I think it's interesting too that you know there's no Hiddleston in this movie. Yeah. You know, he's off anchoring his own show and the, and the feel, and we can already tell, you know, you're getting higher on it, but the feel and the look of the Loki show is way different than yes. Ragnarok. So yeah. it's going to be interesting. You're, and we know that Loki has more than one season. So you kind of kind of have this side by side of like Hiddleston is now the lead guy yeah. on his own show with his own look. And then you're going to have sort of what TT world, you know, with Hemsworth. We'll see. I so wonder what, what really like. I wonder what kind of effect at the box office and the acceptance of Tom Hiddleston's Loki not being in this film is going to be like, because again, this series is raising Todd, Todd Hiddleston's uh, terms of um, what's it? Uh, damn, what's that word? His star power yeah. is getting way bigger because of this show. His star power was already there. Everybody like love Loki. If you see, if you go on YouTube and see when he um, shows up at comic cons or whatever, he's well his character is well loved this is getting him up to another level and his absence from this movie is going to be interesting interesting to see how it affects the box office and as well as the acceptance of this movie well you could but, argue he stole all three of the movies now Hemsworth is clearly the MVP because he's played this role differently each time out which is very hard to do but you know, for the scenes Tom Hiddleston had, you could argue he's the most memorable part of all the yeah. movies. So to take him out is definitely a, a choice. Let us know in the comment section below what you guys think. Next up, Sony says Morbius isn't in the MCU. So as you old guys know that Tyrese is at it again. And we usually say that about uh, Tom Holland you know, and his um, proclamations that this is the best this and this is the best that. Tyrese Gibson is known for saying things that he shouldn't have said. He almost squandered a few billion dollars or a billion dollars from Dre's, uh, Dr. Dre's headphones. Um, and now, and, he, and I'll say this, he said this a while back. This is not nothing new. He said that Morbius was part of the MCU and for some reason this is becoming a big story. He said this a while back. Now, think about this for a second, Brian. We have Venom. I don't know if there's a confirmation that he is going to be 
not that, that not, not that he's not in the MCU, but that that he is in the MCU. We don't we don't have any confirmation. I mean, the, there is talk of Tom Holland want, Tom Holland being in the same film as Venom. I believe Vulture um, is in. We saw we saw a clip of him in one of the trailers. For so 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 to me, Sony saying that he's not in the MCU is quite confusing. I don't is Sony. I don't understand what Sony is trying to do. What secret are they trying to keep? And by the way. For our Spider-Man 3 show, we have confirmations. I'll just say that. For the last time I told you, we have confirmation that Charlie Cox is going to be in Spider-Man No uh, No Way Home. Is it No Way Home? What's it called this time? No Way Home. Yeah. We have confirmation of other people showing up in Spider-Man 3 from a reliable source. And I've told my reliable source, if you're playing me, you will have hell to pay. <laughs> but... This guy is uh, very close to what's going on in that part of the world. But again, I don't understand, Brian, why Sony is trying to keep this a secret and as to say that Morbius is not in the MCU when there's clearly some sort of connection trying to be made with Venom. You have Vulture in one of the trailers. What's going on? What are your thoughts on this? Well, my first thought is it's a legal issue, to be quite honest. Okay. When it comes to you, I'm sure, is a copy. The Marvel Cinematic Universe is a copyrighted designation that belongs to Disney. Mm -hmm. I would guess if Sony were to be representing that their characters were in the MCU without permission, there might be some calls made. Got it, got it. Um, so I actually think some of this might be just the lawyers being conservative about what the studio is officially saying versus what some of the actors might be kind of going around claiming. Now, there's a gray area here because we because of Spider-Man. There's an agree a formal agreement involving Spider-Man. Now, Spider-Man, the way I understand the contract, right, he gets X amount of appearances in the MCU which is how you've seen Tom Holland. But the movies they're making together kind of, they're, they straddle, you know, a couple of different lines. And Venom, Morbius, those movies are on the other side of the line. Those are Sony picture projects. Mm -hmm. so I think that's the difference is that there is some definitional like language and permissions around Spider-Man and the series of Homecoming, Far From Home, No Way Home, that those are considered MCU mm -hmm. movies because we know that. We see them in Marvel trailers. They're listed as MCU movies. Yeah. But you do not see Venom or anything else referenced. I think that's probably what this means. I just, what we, what the TBD that you're referring to is we know that Sony is setting up a Sinister Six. It does seem like marvel and disney are at least somewhat on board maybe passively given the casting discussions we've had but at least are passively on board with this idea and the sides are probably working towards some kind of agreement whereby spider-man and the sinister sticks can go head to head in a movie that is considered canon that kind of but but that is the part that isn't final yet and yeah. so until that's final yeah, there probably is a problem with saying, you know, we've never heard Tom Hardy say he's in the MCU. Yeah, That's yeah, a very yeah, obvious yeah. example. So that would be my best guess. I'm pretty sure Tyrese is getting a, a, a strong lecture. So let us know in the comment section below about uh, Tyrese. Uh, I think it was more of a, somebody asked him a question. He's like, yeah, we're in the MCU. And he just, you know, they took that. I, I don't I don't think he realizes what he was really saying. Um, but I'm pretty sure he's getting a good talking to. Um, our final topic is Disney shifts new shows to Wednesdays. Um, Brian, we had discussed this 
uh, some time ago about that move about releasing Loki in, uh, on a Wednesday, and we thought uh, that it was probably something that they were looking towards the future of releasing shows on not only Fridays, but Wednesdays, as well as Mondays, Tuesdays in the near future. But it seems like from this uh, article, and this comes to us from um, Dark Horizons again, uh, Marvel Studios Loki series has has had um, the biggest launch of any show on Disney Plus service. A possible reason for that beyond the obvious draw of the series itself is a key scheduling change. Disney opted to launch the series on a Wednesday rather than on a Friday, the day they have released new episodes of all their shows since the service began. The move paid off, though so, mu so much so Disney has changed things up and going forward all of its original series will now drop on Wednesdays. This includes all original scripted, unscripted, and animated series. Um, I think probably, and I was watching the John Campier show and he made mention that on Fridays, you know, movies are released, right? These are the big openings for movies and perhaps because things are sort of coming back to normal that, you know, for these releases, they don't want to sort of compete with audiences um, on, on a Friday. I mean, it makes kind of sense, but at again, for the most part, um, I think a lot of fans watch this midnight or whenever it comes as early as possible because nobody's going to movie at eight o'clock or ten o'clock in the morning some may do but for the most part most people are watching this as early as possible i stay away from social media when these things come out because people can't help themselves but it seemed to have worked for them in terms of viewership do you still think, um, first of all, what do you think about this move of just releasing on Wednesdays, all their, all their shows? Uh, and do you believe that in the future, it may not be just on a Wednesday and it may be other days? I'll, I'll have to say this, that Wednesdays come quick. Fridays take a long time to come. So I like the move to Wednesday. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I don't think it's just competing with films. Um, I think it's actually competing with the world reopening. You know, people going out on Friday night because they couldn't do that, you know, last year. And um, there's probably some recognition of that. Because, I mean, don't forget that a lot of big movies actually don't open on Friday. They do Thursday midnight. They yeah. do Wednesday before a holiday weekend. Like, it's actually pretty common for a movie to open not just on a Friday. So I think it goes beyond that. Um, yeah. My struggle with everything coming out on the same day is just the amount of stuff in the pipeline for Disney, it just seems very hard for the sheer volume of that to just be captured by all the audiences are trying to hit. So yeah. that's why to me, I do think in the future it, it could, and I would argue it should look a little bit more like, you know, nineties television. I think you should kind of group your genres and your shows, you know, as your kid, kid stuff is Monday night you know superheroes is tuesday night star wars is wednesday night i think that's yeah. actually the easier way to go because right now it's easy because yeah. disney's basically putting out one flagship show at a time but we know where we're headed you can oh. see the production schedule you're gonna have a point where you're going to have a star you know one to two star wars shows one to two marvel shows one yeah, to two yeah, Nat yeah. Geo shows. they're all going to be on at the same time yeah, so yeah. If they're all coming on the same day like i mean i love these shows but i can't get to all of them on the day off it's just not possible so but if you give me a chance to be like all right i gotta allocate one hour a night or two hours you know couple, like is a better chance i think of eventizing each yeah. episode which i think is ultimately the goal goal of any of these shows so i actually do think it'll wind up being more than more than one one day a week yeah, that makes sense. I mean, yeah, you're right. Um, on the at the pace that they're going, right now, you know, you get these one these one series at a time sort of situation because they're building their other stuff. Once you get all that going, you're not going to release two joints. 
at this, on the same day. You're going to release probably one on Wednesday, one on Tuesday or Thursday. Who knows? But definitely they're, they're, they're um, creating multiple things where at some point, you know, they're going to have a bunch of stuff to release. Um, and yeah, it only makes sense for them to do that. Um, but Wednesdays, again, I'm, I'm happy about Wednesdays because Wednesdays for me come quick. Fridays take forever to come. So, well, ladies and gentlemen, that's our show for today. Please be on the lookout for our Spider-Man 3 show. We're going to really dive deep, dive deep into that and really discuss the implications of what we may be getting in terms of the multiverse. Um, what sort of problems can arrive from this? Um, and what are the possible uh, pros for this? Um, I, ju I don't see a pro, honestly, in, in my opinion. But we're going to get, um, we're going to dive deep into that uh, subject matter, as well as we're going to talk about, probably give you a review of the second and third episode of Loki. And Brian, I don't know if you've watched um, uh, the second episode. I'm behind you. No, I'm going to watch it tomorrow, actually. So. Okay. Let me know as soon as you watch it. Just give, just tell me, give me a reaction, uh, emoji or something, <laughs> uh, about because I'm telling you, man, I there's just so much stuff in in this in this in this series that your mind you can't help but theorize. You can't, you, and you know people theorize and then whatever they theorize doesn't come to pass and they get upset. And we and some people say, ah, oh, don't theorize, just watch them. It's it's difficult to do that. It's difficult to do that with the information that you're given to not theorize and and speculate and all this. It's fun, but if they don't come to pass, they don't come to pass. I wasn't bent out of shape when it, you know when Mephisto didn't show up, but I'm pretty sure Mephisto is involved somehow, some way, and 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 it'll be revealed at a later date. Um, but. Loki is, is 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 a hell of a show. So keep, keep an eye out for that review. Um, Brian, any last words? Um, I have decided to go see Black Widow in the theater. I got my tickets. Oh, you did too. Okay. Yeah, I got my tickets. I, I the day that you text when you texted me, they're available. I went online. I got great seats at the IMAX. I got it for the Saturday. I didn't get it for the the opening. I got it for that weekend. I'm going to go on a Saturday, like around noon or one o'clock, I believe I got it for. Hey, we back, baby. Black Widow, again, I'm going to say it, is going to be on par with Winter Soldier. I don't know if you still believe that it may not be. That's too far, That's too high of a bar. I don't know if you that's feel that way. That's a high bar. That's best in MCU. <laughs> I think it can be. I think it, it looks like it. The trailers look like it. Some of the huge, it's just, I think it's going to have a lot of things that are going to be very, very uh, exciting to watch. And, and, and um, I just think it's going to be great. I'm looking forward to going back to the movies and see a Marvel film. Uh, but that's our show for today. Please hit that like and subscribe button, hit that notification bell, share it with your friends. It really does help support the channel. I know that I say that all the time, but it really, really, really does. And we'll see you next time on North Journey Report.